am I chasing and am I getting the adaptation that I want? Sometimes the adaptation doesn't happen in four weeks. I know this is mind blowing stuff, right? Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and man, today we are going to bring one of my old favorite podcasts back from the dead. Now, probably wondering, man, Mike, why are we getting a, kind of a refurbished episode? And that is a great question. Without giving you all of the nitty gritty details, it has just been a week. I don't know how else to describe that. Between, let's see... Cade's birthday and party and all the things that went on last weekend, I promise I have had so many Zoom calls, Google meetings, in-person meetings. We're getting ready to leave for vacation tomorrow. I mean, there is just so much going on (laughs) this week, and I feel like the universe is against me getting a new show out. So I've got some stuff recorded. Don't worry, there's going to be a new one next week, and I promise this is if not my most highly rated and one of my most highly downloaded episodes of all time, it's pretty darn close. Uh, And part of the reason I wanted to share this episode again is because sometimes, you know, when you create stuff on the internet, it's not like a book. Or maybe it is, but it's not quite the same. So if you got a great book and you got it on your bookshelf, you go back and you look at it from time to time and you're like, oh man, that book was great. I should reread that. I find that happening to myself all the time. But when it comes to content on the internet, I feel like the further down the line it gets from when it was launched or when it was released, people assume that either it's not good, it's not relevant, or they can't benefit from it. I just don't think that's the case. Today's episode is all about program design. And actually, I just did an IG Live with my guy Steve Clarko the other day. We were talking about assessments, programming, coaching, my upcoming Complete Coach Seminar that we're doing at his gym in West Hartford, Connecticut. And one of the things that we dove in on was program design because I feel like there's a lot of people out there these days, especially on the internet, trying to make it so complex. They're trying to make you feel like if you don't know everything there is to know about training, coaching, program design, if you don't know it all, like you can't possibly write a good program. So you have to pay them an exorbitant amount of money to learn from them. Or you just have to give all your time and attention to them and the 30 Instagram posts they make a day. And let's be honest here. You know, there is nuance to what we do. I feel like there are core philosophies and core things you have to understand to write good programs. But I also feel like, hey, you know, like, some of the big rocks are just there. And once you know those, then it comes down to the nuance and it comes down to getting more reps in. So that's why I wanted to share this episode again. I feel like it's still incredibly valuable. I feel like a lot of the key points and key tenets that I discuss are still incredibly relevant and they are going to help you write better training programs. So whether you take one thing from it, 10, 15, all 19, it doesn't matter to me. If you just find a couple things to latch onto and start using that make your program design more efficient and more effective, then I feel like that's a win. So we're gonna take a quick break and then we're gonna jump into this awesome episode about program design. It seems like every day I talk to a young trainer or coach who is frustrated. Maybe they're frustrated with the results they're getting. Maybe they're frustrated because they don't have trusted resources to learn from. And maybe they're frustrated because they simply don't have enough clients and wonder how long they'll be able to stay in the industry. So if that sounds anything like you, I've got something that I know will help. My Complete Coach Certification was created for trainers and coaches just like you, who are serious about the results they get and who know that becoming a better coach can directly translate to a bigger bottom line. This certification is going to take the last 20 years of my life's work and put it all into one massive course. In it, you'll learn how to use the R7 system to create seamless, integrated, and efficient programs for clients and athletes of all shapes and sizes. How to create the culture, environment, and relationships with everyone you train so you can get the absolute best results. And the exact progressions, regressions, and coaching cues I use in the gym from squatting and deadlifting to pressing and pulling and everything in between. Of course, there's a ton more that I cover, 
but that should give you a pretty good idea of what the cert is all about. Now here's the thing, spots for the certification will only open twice per year for a limited time only. To get on the insiders list, just head over to completecoachcertification.com. Again, completecoachcertification.com and then stay tuned for emails in the coming weeks. Thanks so much for your support and I hope you'll pick up a copy of the Complete Coach Certification when it launches. Today, we are going to talk about program design. And, you know, just to give you guys a little bit of insight here, like I am still to this day beyond passionate about learning in this industry. I'm beyond passionate, as you can probably tell, about teaching and trying to give back, uh, you know, the things that I'd like to think uh, I've learned over the years. And for me, content creation is one of the most rewarding things that I get to do on a week to week basis because, you know, when I work with a client or, a, or an athlete in the gym, it's amazing. I get to work with them. I see that change. You know, I know I've got that in the trenches feel that, look, this kid's getting better every single day. That's awesome. But when I create content, I get to help people at scale. So whether it's an article, whether it's a YouTube video, whether it's a podcast, really doesn't matter. When I'm creating content, I know that I am putting something out there that is going to make people better across the globe. And so that's really empowering for me. And that's why I want to talk today about program design because it's something I'm constantly thinking about. Obviously, as coaches, as trainers, we're writing programs, if not every day, at least every week. And I feel like it's one of those things where just when you think you have it all figured out, you start to have some realizations of, man, I was good before, but I can be even better if I do this, or I can be even better if I do Y. So kind of the whole premise behind this was, look, there's a lot of good places to learn the X's and O's of basic training. But what I want to do is really dive in to some specific examples, some things that I've seen over the years, and some things that I feel like are going to make a huge impact on you as a coach, as a trainer, when it comes to writing your programs. So without any further ado or build up, let's go ahead and jump right in. I think I got 19 of them, so it's gonna take a hot minute, but here we go. Number one, and I really like this one, so remember it, especially if you're a young coach. Number one, don't be Vladimir Izurin before you're Tudor Bampa. Now, what do I mean by that? And if you haven't ever read Tudor Bampa or you don't know who he is, You need to check yourself. You need to go to the library because it's such an old book. It's probably at the library. But I think a lot of young coaches now kind of feel the need to show how smart they are, right? If you're a young coach, it's okay. You don't have to act like you know everything. The second you can put your ego aside, the easier it's going to be for you. But, you know, for us old heads, Tudor Bampa was like the guy for learning the basics of periodization and sets and reps and how to lay out you know, various uh, program design schemes, whether it's hypertrophy, anatomical adaptation, strength, power. He gives you all the basics, right? But I think on the larger scale, what you see is a lot of people these days, they want to get right to the good stuff. They want to learn the most advanced techniques. And the analogy that I would use is, you know, if you're trying to learn like triple block periodization, it's kind of like trying to learn calculus before you've learned addition and subtraction. You have to learn the constituent parts first. So understand the basics. You know, if you don't understand the basics, if you don't understand, you know, why you choose certain set rep schemes, why you would choose certain times under tension, why you would choose certain rest periods, like who cares about all the cool stuff? It doesn't matter yet. Learn the basics first. Learn to own the basics. Because if you can just do that, I guarantee your programs are going to be better than about 90% of the people out there. You don't have to be on to the coolest stuff. You know, I, I remember one of our kids uh, who was an intern with us. I won't name his name, but if he listens, he'll know who he is. You know, was talking. We were doing a program design talk, and he starts asking about French contrast training with Cal Dietz. And I'm like, look, dude, you don't need French contrast training right now. Like, you don't even need to know why that works. All right? For now, learn how to squat bench press, deadlift, hang clean, um, teach your athletes how to jump effectively, how to sprint effectively, like give them all the basics throughout their programming and you're going to get really good results. And when you get that super elite athlete that's trying to get the last 0.001% out of their body, then use French contrast training. So, you know, I say all this to prove the point of 
we have to get better at the basics first. You have to understand the basics. It's like anything else, the better you understand the basics, when it's time to get into the advanced stuff, the easier it's gonna be. Number two, paint by numbers at least initially. You guys probably all remember, at some point we had those little paint by numbers books or, or magazines, whatever they are. My kids still have them today. You know, So number one is red, number two is yellow, number three is green. And when it's all said and done, you've got this pretty little picture. Well, don't be afraid to do that when you're writing programs early on. Too often, I think people want to go out and create the next Mona Lisa. And look, I'll raise my hand here. I was guilty of this. Like the first training program I ever wrote was for myself. And I tell you what, in whatever, 16 years of playing sports growing up, I never once threw up in a practice after my first training session that I wrote for myself, I literally threw up. Only time in my entire life. And it was a really good lesson. Like, man, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, quite frankly, I don't know what I'm doing. And I needed to go back and find a template. I needed to find something that I could work from. Because, look, you're not going to create the Mona Lisa until you have a basic understanding, again, of the constituent parts. Like, what makes a great program? And I would say along those same lines, don't try and be cute. You know, I think too often when we try and be cute or when we try and be really smart with our programming, that's when things kind of get hairy or when we don't see the, the level of success that we would like. So don't try and be cute about it. You know, just give a really sound and solid training program. And I think when you do this too, when you kind of follow somebody else's template, like for us, you could follow the R7 template that I use, that we use at iFast. I think it's a great system because it gives you the ability to check all the boxes. You know that you're releasing, resetting, um, readying, doing the reactive work, doing the resistance work. You're checking all the boxes throughout that program. So use a template like that because what it allows you to do is within that framework, you see what really works, right? That's what it's all about. Like the longer you do this, you want to try and figure out and flesh out what really works and what doesn't. And once you've done that, then you can start to tweak and refine. And, and this leads me to not only a discussion that I was having a while back, but I believe it was Stuart McMillan said this in one of his videos on the Altus website. But he was talking about how, you know, early on as a coach, you don't know much. So the only thing that you know is simple, right? Because that's how your mind works. You're not exposed to a lot. You don't have a great understanding. So you have to do simple stuff. And over time, you start collecting information and you start collecting ideas. And if you can imagine going up to the top of a bell curve, you get to this point where, you know, things are really difficult. They're really complex. And, you know, at a certain point, you probably hit threshold and you realize, man, why am I making this so hard on myself? Or why am I making this so complicated? And as a result, then you start to pair and you trim away the excess. So you tr start to trim away the fat where ultimately, again, at the, the bottom of the bell curve or at the end of the bell curve, now you're back to simple again, but it's with a totally different understanding. So that's what I would implore you to do, especially early on. Don't worry about painting a masterpiece. It doesn't have to be a Mona Lisa, right? Paint by numbers, learn the basics, learn the mechanics so that you can better understand what truly works and what doesn't. It's going to make you so much better in the long run, I promise you. Okay, number three. When it's all said and done, program design and training is all about the adaptation. So when you're setting up a program, you have to be incredibly clear as to what adaptation are you trying to chase. You know, back in the day, we would call our phases maybe like an accumulation phase, a max strength phase, and a power phase. Now, I don't know if it's all that different, but we would probably have like an accumulation block, we would have a force block, and then probably like a power or a conversion block, you know, if we've got three. But ultimately, you have to be really, really focused on what the adaptation is that you're chasing. Because if you don't understand that, you know, how are you measuring success? And this is what it always comes back to for me, like how do you measure success? And an accumulation block, I always look at it as, as I'm, am I getting more total volume in over the course of that block? That's pretty simple. You know, in a force training block, am I increasing this guy's peak force numbers over the course of this three or four week segment? 
And you know, in the last block, when it comes to power, am I actually improving their power output? Am I seeing meaningful change in, say, a 10-yard dash, in a vertical jump, in a broad jump? But at the end of the day, guys, you have to remember it's not training for the sake of training, right? This is where a lot of coaches go wrong when it comes to conditioning because they think, oh, you just run these athletes until they're dog tired and, you know, now they're in shape. And that's not the case because ultimately the adaptation that they're imposing is incorrect and it makes their athletes worse. So always ask yourself, am I chasing and am I getting the adaptation that I want? So... Number four, or bullet point number four, piggybacks directly on this because sometimes the adaptation doesn't happen in four weeks. I know this is mind-blowing stuff, right? But think about this. When I first started writing programs and, you know, I was influenced by tons of different people, but if you look at a lot of the textbooks that are out there, everything is in this nice, pretty four-week block, you know? So you have this pretty four-week anatomical adaptation phase and a four-week hypertrophy phase, and a four-week strength phase. And, you know, they assume that we're training robots that are incredibly linear in their adaptation. Everything you throw at them, they adapt to successfully and in a consistent manner. And, you know, it's not that pretty, guys. It doesn't work like that. And I'll give you two real-world examples. I actually talked about this years ago, uh, two years ago, actually, at our physical preparation summit here in Indianapolis. And Joe Ken had told me that when he got to the NFL, he was shocked at how high level these athletes were and stuff that would take a college kid three weeks or three months to learn. These guys were learning in three sets. And, you know, look, man, I love Joe, but, you know, that's kind of hard to fathom until I started working with a guy from the NFL about a year after that. And this dude had one of the worst RDLs I'd ever seen in set one and by set three it was literally flawless okay so what does this mean well you know adaptation occurs differently across different people you know so for this particular guy he learned a motor skill in three sets now that doesn't mean you know check that box we move on from that exercise there's still a lot of room for improvement there and we can start loading the pattern and building it out but you know he adapts a heck of a lot faster than a lot of my, you know, more basic, what I would consider just general population lifting clients. So on the flip side of that coin, a guy that I've worked with for probably four and a half, five years now, we had been training him for a year or two. He was seeing success, but literally every four weeks I was changing his assistance exercises. And, you know, maybe a year and a half, two years in, he says, you know, I mean, I'm seeing progress, but I feel like just when I start to figure out my assistance lifts, we change them up. So can we move it instead of four weeks, can we stretch it out to eight weeks? And I was like, yeah, sure. That's, I mean, it's actually easier for me from a programming perspective. You know, maybe we just bump up the intensity, cut a few reps per set, and yeah, let's absolutely do it. And I was shocked at how much more improvement we saw out of his lifts as a result. So take home message here, you know, it's all about the adaptation, but sometimes the adaptation doesn't take four weeks. Your higher level athletes, they're probably going to learn and absorb things and adapt very, very quickly. It's why they're so amazing at what they do. It might be as short as two to three weeks. Your general pop clients or your people that aren't as malleable, man, it could be six, it could be eight, it could be 10, it could be taking 12 weeks to get the adaptation that you want. So really start to try and figure this out with each and every client that you work with because it's going to change the game as far as your program design goes. Number five, and this is a big one that I think a lot of people understand inherently, but they maybe don't explain it super well. So number five is when you think about changing time under tension, start to think of it as really playing around and manipulating the stretch shortening cycle. So let me give you an example. If we use a three number system to describe a lift, say three, zero, one. The three seconds is the eccentric or the lowering portion of the lift. The zero is any pause at the midpoint. And the last number is the concentric or the overcoming portion of the lift. So if I go three, zero, one, I really start to take away the stretch shortening cycle, right? Or if I, let's say I go three, two, one. So on a squat, three seconds down, two second pause, one second to come up. Now I'm really taking away 
the stretch shortening cycle from that from that lift. So what am I really doing? Well, I'm I'm preferentially, let's see if I can talk. I am preferentially loading specific elements of either the muscle or the tendon, right? So when I really start to take away that stretch shortening cycle and I take away that elasticity, now I'm overloading muscle. So maybe in a specific anatomical adaptation phase, that's something I'm chasing. If I'm a bodybuilder and I'm trying to get super strong, I don't want to be bouncing off connective tissue. I want to slow things down. And that's where, you know, some tempo lifting or oxidative lifting for uh, your bodybuilders, these slow times under tension could be really, really valuable. Now, on the flip side of that, for our athletes, you know, we probably want to maximize the ability to use that stretch shortening cycle, especially for our athletes that need to be super fast and explosive. Yeah, there's a time and a place to build the muscle. And I think sometimes slowing down the time under tension is really good for building that musculotendinous junction, the connective tissues. There's value in it early in an off season. But as I move on, I want to maximize and make as efficient as possible the utilization of that stretch shortening cycle. So it's maybe just a different way to look at it. But just know and understand, when you start to play around with time under tension, what you're really doing is preferentially loading either the muscle or the tendon. And once you start to understand that, it's going to really change and shape the way you program time under tension. Okay, number six. This is more of just a good life rule, not just in program design, but anytime you want to accomplish something at a high level. Number six. When you are writing programs, remove all distractions. Now, I tell you this because unfortunately nowadays we are absolutely inundated with stuff, right? Like I'm sitting in front of my laptop, my phone is at this point in time charging in the other room, and sometimes I've got my iPad. So you've got to imagine I might get one notification, like one text message and get three different dings. Or somebody could hit me up from the business and, you know, I get a message on Slack and I've got this pinging me across three different devices. And that doesn't even include reminders or phone calls or anything else. So distraction is such a hindrance to us writing a great program. So this is more of a mindset thing. If you're going to write programs and you're going to write a great program, remove all the distraction. Put your Wi-Fi in airplane mode or your phone, whatever it is, you can turn the Wi-Fi off on your laptop, really dial in and focus on the task at hand. Um, If possible, I've got specific music that I listen to. You'll probably laugh, but like Dead Mouse. I don't know what it is about his music. It's got this trance-like effect. I would imagine that 80% of the writing and program design that I've done over the last four to five years has been two Dead Mouse and probably just two or three different albums. And I can tell you, I can put the headphones on and I've got an hour of just amazing work in me. And so doing those little things to try and focus your energy and focus on the task at hand is absolutely critical. It's going to make sure that you write the best program possible. So to combine with that, number seven, not only are you going to remove all distractions, but I want you to serial batch and write all of your programs at one time. Now, I'll tell you why I do this. When iFast was evolving, I had taken myself off the floor. We'd been open maybe two, two and a half years at this point in time. So I was just working in the afternoons and we hired a gentleman to work mornings. And so one of my rewards to myself on Friday morning was I would take myself out to breakfast, right? So I'm at breakfast and, you know, having this amazing omelet. I go next door to the coffee shop and I'm enjoying a coffee and I'm like, okay, I got some programs to write. How many do I have? And I realized I have 20 programs to write for that week because I had online clients, I had iFast clients that I was still coaching, and I had this guy's clients because he wasn't prepared to write programs yet. So you can imagine when I got to write 20 programs in like two and a half, three hours, just do the math on that. That doesn't give you a lot of time to write programs. Now, luckily for me, a lot of them were more like fat loss programs. They were quick and easy updates. They weren't super complex, like a high-level athlete. But still, 20 programs in two and a half to three hours is a lot. So what I found was when I would sit down and I would serial batch or write all these programs at once, the first program, even if it's a simple fat loss update, may take 15 minutes. But then the next one takes 13. 
and the one after that takes 11. And then maybe you're just cranking them out and each program update takes eight to 10 minutes. So it's crazy to think how this happens, but what, what ends up happening is you get so dialed in, you get so focused, and your brain basically goes to this little space that is just purely for program design. And it makes all of your execution that much faster. So not only do you have that, but the thing that I found is as I started doing that, it literally started to clarify and streamline all my progressions, all my regressions, or as we're calling it now, our trainable menu. Everything got dialed in over this period of time because I was in this one unique space and it was all about writing the best possible programs. So it's really interesting how the brain works. So whether it's writing, whether it's studying, whether it's writing programs, I would implore you, you know, remove all the distractions and then try and do all these like-minded tasks at the same time because you'll just be shocked at how fast you can start to crank these out. And it doesn't mean you're sloppy. Right? It doesn't mean I'm just randomly throwing exercises at the wall. It's like the first one's taking the most time and energy because I'm getting my mind into that space. But then, you know, once I'm there, man, now everything is just flowing and everything is coming so easily to me. So, especially if you have a lot of programs to write on a week to week basis, I would implore you serial batch it, do all of them at once because I guarantee each and every program is going to be far, far better. Okay. Number eight, and this kind of plays into um, our previous point about the adaptation, but I'm going to quote the great Dan John here. The goal is to keep the goal the goal. Now, what do I mean by that? What does he mean by that? One of the biggest issues that interns have, like our interns at IFAST, when they start writing programs is they're overwhelmed with options. So there's so many things that they're thinking about. They're thinking about the program that they're doing now or the program that their high school coach wrote them five years ago that they really liked. And they're thinking about the programming book that they read and the article that they just read about programming. So there's no way to filter out all of this information. And it becomes overwhelming to the point where they can't put anything coherent together. So here's what I always tell them is that at the end of the day, Imagine you're working with a client. If they have one goal, if you have one goal for them to accomplish in this training session or in this training block, what would it be? And if you can answer that question, that is your totem. That is your anchor that you always come back to. And look, this is this has happened to me, guys. I guarantee you, like I'm thinking back to about five years ago where I started getting a lot of high-level athletes and from a lot of different sports, right? So like high-level baseball high-level football, high-level soccer, high-level basketball. And so there was this period of time where, man, I'm writing these incredibly complex programs and we're trying to layer, you know, smart speed and power development, smart strength training, smart conditioning, layering all these pieces across not only one program, but multiple months of programs. And so this was like my guiding light. When I would start to get kind of lost in my own thought or overwhelmed with what I want to accomplish with an athlete, I would always ask myself, if I can only accomplish one thing with this program, what would it be? And it gives you such a great perspective on what you need to do and the direction you need to take with a specific program or with a specific athlete. So, you know, maybe another way to think of it as an intern, if you can only create one adaptation for this training block, what do you want to accomplish? So if you start to think of things in that fashion, it streamlines everything that you do. It narrows your scope. It narrows your focus. And I think ultimately it gives you a filter to pass things through. Because, you know, if it doesn't create that adaptation, if it doesn't chase that one goal, then it doesn't go in the program. And it makes your life very, very simple. Okay, number nine. And hopefully this doesn't piss too many people off. But number nine, remember it's all GPP. We are general physical preparation coaches. I'm not gonna teach the football offensive lineman how to block. I'm not gonna teach the wide receiver how to catch a football. I'm not gonna teach my soccer guys how to kick a soccer ball. That's sport specific. Those are skills that skills and tactical coaches are going to do. Now, it doesn't mean I have no concept or no understanding of what they do. I don't believe that's the case at all. 
And whenever I really dedicate myself to working with a sport, I try and learn as much as I possibly can about the skills, the techniques, the tactics, because that makes me a better coach. It allows me to have more relatability to them. It allows me to truly understand um, what their coach wants, what they feel like they need to get out of their body. So that doesn't pass the buck, but it does help us remember that at the end of the day, I am trying to build general physical qualities that will carry over to their sport. And, you know, that's something I think too often we miss the boat on. Like, I'm not trying to make the world's best squatter just so I can say, yeah, my kid squatted 500 pounds. Like, that's not the point. I use a squat because I want to teach somebody to change levels. I want to teach them how to absorb force better. I want to teach them to triple flex through their ankles, their knees, their hips. There's a lot of reasons I would teach somebody to squat or to deadlift, all right? But at the end of the day, I realize that is not ultimately truly specific to their sport. There's nothing more specific than them running, jumping, cutting, and doing things of that nature. And it just kind of reminds me of a discussion that we had years ago. Mike Ron Karate, uh, brilliant guy, two of the best podcasts I've had on this show still to date, was talking about, you know, the year before they had won a ring with the Golden State Warriors. And, you know, I'm like, look, dude, what what is it? Like, what what gives you guys that level of success? And, and part of it, in our world, we're always thinking it's us. Like, something that we're doing is giving them that chance for success. And, you know, look, we can keep guys healthy. But, I mean, his answer was so point blank. It was like, look, the reason those two teams were in the finals, we had Steph Curry, they had LeBron James. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, you're right. Like, at the end of the day, it's all about skill, right? And and our job is to give the athlete or give the coach his best, best athletes, make them as strong, as robust, as resilient as possible so that each and every game he can put his best players out there. You know, and then at the end of the day, you really hope you have the most skilled athletes in the world. Because I don't care how much strength training and how much great performance training I do, I could have the best program ever. I'm not going to go out there and be able to beat Lionel Messi in a soccer game. Okay? So general physical preparation. That's what we do. We build better athletes so that ultimately when they go to their sport coach, they can layer the skills, the techniques, and the tactics that will make them elite at their sport. Number 10. This is a big one. Use your off day training to fuel your big sessions. So a little bit of insight here. Like I'm a huge believer in the kind of high low system, if you will. Um, And I know Derek Hansen has talked about this ad nauseum, Charlie Francis, and, and really Derek has done a great job of talking about micro dosing and giving elements of high intensity work on a daily basis. I think there's a ton of merit to that. But I think Along those same lines, something that gets lost in this message is, let's say Monday, Wednesday, Friday are your high-intensity days. You check those boxes. I would turn that around and say, well, what are you doing on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday to earn the right to train intensely on Monday, Wednesday, Friday? And it's a huge shift in mindset because too often we just assume that an athlete is ready to go. You know, Now, if you're monitoring, if you're doing subjective Uh, wellness scores, if you're doing HRV, if you're tracking, say, uh, their velocity or their jump profile or performance on a day-to-day basis, you start to get some understanding here. But like, if you look at this stuff long enough, a lot of athletes are coming in and Monday is one of their worst days. And they're training like dog shit on Monday because they haven't done anything of value since Friday's session that they just did with you, right? Friday, maybe they went out. Saturday, they sat around all day, Netflix and chill. Saturday, maybe they go out. Sunday, recover. And then Monday, they come in the gym. You have not earned the right to train intensely on that day. So maybe a better way to think of this is how can you stimulate recovery on your off days? And this is why you know, I'm such a big believer in whether it's tempo running, whether it's low-intensity cardiac output sessions, You know, there's lots of ways to stimulate recovery on off days. And 
for me, it's stimulating recovery or creating like a non-competing adaptation. So if I'm doing high intensity stuff, like high CNS stuff, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, maybe Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I'm working on just more general GPP or I'm doing some tempo running or again, cardiac output, which is maybe just kind of flushing the entire body from a muscular perspective, but then chasing more of a central adaptation at the heart. So ultimately what I'm always thinking about is not just how important Monday, Wednesday, Friday are or how much I wanna push them on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, But most importantly, how can I use Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday to prep them for the next training session to make sure it's high quality, right? And I think that's a big shift in mindset. It's not just we're going high Monday, Wednesday, Friday. No, I'm going to use those off days to facilitate recovery to ensure that those high intensity days are not just high intensity, but they're high quality as well. So little shift in mindset there, but I think if you start thinking in that fashion, it's really going to improve the quality of every session that you do. Okay, number 11, meet them where they are with regards to exercise selection. Now, this is a big one because too often, especially if we're of a certain age, we have favorite pet lifts. And maybe the, the younger kids... Um, and the young coaches that are listening in now, maybe you have your pet lifts too, but a lot of us that have been around for a long time come from either an Olympic lifting background or a powerlifting background. And so we really love those lifts. We really want to use them with every single client. But I think the longer we do this and the more open we are to finding the best strategies for our athletes, you know, we start to realize, hey, you can't fit the square peg in the round hole. So there are certain movement skills that I want every athlete to learn. And I know this is going to make some people angry, but like literally every person that are, that comes in our gym is going to learn a variation of a squat, of a deadlift, of a split squat or lunge, of a push up. You know, because these are all fundamental movements that I want every client, every athlete, regardless of age to be able to execute. Okay? But at the same time, everybody's going to look a little bit different. Right? So You know, I've got this article coming out on Monday. Uh, Based on when you hear this, it may already be out. But it's all about training tall athletes. Should we squat our tall athletes? And look, guys, I am just of the firm belief that, yes, you should squat your tall athletes. You should give them that movement skill. Now, that doesn't mean you load up 315, put a barbell on their back, and hope they can squat up and down with it. That's not the case. But I think if you're doing all the right things in the other parts of your program and you're giving them the right exercise to execute, man, everybody should be able to squat at a decent level, right? You just regress the exercise to a level that is safe and effective for them. So ultimately, you have to ask yourself, what can this person do successfully, right? Not everybody is going to barbell deadlift from the floor. Not everybody is going to barbell bench press. Not everybody's going to put a barbell on their back and squat, Okay, but look at this client, look at this athlete in front of you and ask yourself, what can they do effectively? And then start there, right? Or better yet, what can they do incredibly well? So wherever they're at, take them one notch even further back, right? So they can really have some success. So they can really gain some confidence and then push them forward from there. You know, even like a session or two. And I do this all the time with my athletes, right? I try not to make it fake because it's not. But it's like, man, you just crushed that exercise. Like, man, I had you scheduled to do this for four weeks, two weeks. You're good. Let's move on to the next thing. Because that's incredibly fulfilling to hear as a client or as an athlete. It's incredibly fulfilling to feel successful in the gym. So meet them where they are with regards to exercise selection. And in some cases, underwhelm them. Okay, which actually leads me to point number 12. As a whole, I make it a goal to underwhelm clients and athletes early and not in (laughs) regards to how much I care about them or my enthusiasm or my energy level. But, you know, you can do like two sets of very basic stuff of maybe four or five exercises, a little bit of movement work, a little bit of conditioning, and people can be super, super sore the next day. And I'm constantly shocked, like, I try and underwhelm people early on because I'm really focused on improving movement skill, improving efficiency, and I'm not going to do that for long, but just by virtue of teaching somebody to move well or to move more effectively, they are often shocked at how sore they are after a session. They'll be like, man, I didn't even feel like I worked that hard, but man, I'm sore in muscles I didn't know I had. 
that's the, the desired effect for me. That's what I'm looking for. So that first, especially three, four weeks, is a big focus and emphasis on movement quality and coaching. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, well, what do I do with fat loss clients? Because fat loss clients are notorious for being like the least patient people, right? Even if somebody's 50 pounds overweight, they just want to get crushed on day one. So what do you do with that person? So here's what I do, and feel free to take it and run with it. If not, I'm okay with that too, but this has worked really well for me, and I feel like for most of the guys at our gym. Fat loss people have the worst work capacity of any client you're going to you're going to work with, right? For a lot of reasons. They've got awful work capacity, so it doesn't make any sense to smash them on day 1. So here's what I do. If I'm going to make something high intensity for them, I'm going to give them, you know, all the basic lifts in their session. So if we're talking R5 and the resistance component, we're still going to find a squat variation and a push-up variation and maybe a split stance variation. We're going to do all that stuff. And then if I want something to be high intensity, I'm going to do it at the end in a very safe and effective manner or in a non-threatening manner, I guess is a better way to put it. So I'm going to put them on the bike and maybe we do 8 to 10 seconds on, 50 to 52 seconds off. So now they still get that high intensity uh, feel, they get that burn, they get that good sweat going, they feel like they worked hard, but I know I taught them movement skills up front, I know I got a good kind of aerobic effect on the back end, even though it's high level, it's alactic for that eight to 10 seconds, and then they've got that 50 seconds of recovery work. So if you can do that kind of stuff, that allows you to kind of underwhelm them with some of the strength training stuff up front, but it starts to give you the adaptation that you want over the long term. Because ultimately, fat loss clients need to improve work capacity. You know, doing two sets of stuff forever isn't going to cut it. So if I can find ways to underwhelm them and to give them more work capacity early on, that's going to lead me to successes down the road. So, you know, if they want to feel worked out, Find ways to do it in the conditioning. And it doesn't have to be the bike. It could be the bike. Sometimes it can be the prowler. uh, It can be dragging a sled or even just battling ropes. I mean, there's so many low-level options there where you don't have to beat somebody up. You can get this really strong metabolic effect where they get the endorphin rush. They feel like they're working hard. But ultimately, you know they're doing it in a safe and non-threatening manner. Okay, number 13. If you train athletes, don't be afraid to train them in season. And I've had some really amazing collegiate level strength coaches on here. When you talk about Corey Schlesinger, when you talk about Ryan Horn, when you talk about Josh Bonatal, these are guys that are working with some of the best basketball players in the United States. And a lot of them are training these guys multiple times per week, if not daily. Okay. So it comes down to what is the athlete prepared for, right? Like if an athlete is prepared to train at a high level, if you are sensible with the volume, with the intensity, if you're choosing the right exercises, there's tons of things that you can do in season to help preserve and maintain the health and the resilience of your athletes. So this is something I can't stress strongly enough. I think, you know, this year uh, as a soccer club has been one of the most frustrating, frustrating ones for me. You know, part of it has been the scheduling, part of it has been just the general amount of time I've had with the guys, but this is the most soft tissue injuries I've had in any given season. And so I'm always looking at ways that I can address it as a coach. Um, Obviously, I feel like if I had the guys more frequently in season, I could do more with them, but part of that is just scheduling. You know, when you have a hurricane that, you know, shuts down your Saturday game and has to get pushed to Wednesday, you know, it just jacks the entire rhythm and flow up. But if you guys are finding ways to train your athletes in season, and what we tell our high school athletes at iFast is, look, I mean, you don't have to be here twice, three times a week. You know, if I can get you twice, that's ideal. But if I can get you even once a week, I can do a lot of stuff to not only stave off the injury monster, but to maintain the gains with a Z, the gains that you have spent this whole off season accumulating. And that's something we're always trying to pitch, not only to the athlete, but to the parents as well. So that when they come back, hey man, we're starting from not too far off where we're at now. Versus if you take the next three, four, five months off and then come back, we're starting back at square one again and nobody wants that. So don't be afraid to train in season. I think hopefully we're all beyond that, 
but I still think there's a certain segment of coaches that need to hear that and need to really embrace that idea. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, number 14. I really like this one. There's a difference between what I would call the introductory week and a deload week. Case in point, when I was writing programs, when I started writing programs back in the day, I was a big believer in, man, that adaptation, bro, it's coming on week four. You got to make sure you deload because as a system, just, you know, chronic accumulated stress by week four, your body needs a break. Okay. Just forget that, right? Forget about that. It may happen, but we know everybody's rhythm is flow is a little bit different. So what I've gotten away from over the years is getting away from this concept of a deload week at all. What I do more of is what I call an introductory week. So a deload week would happen on week four. So you go three, you know, fairly intense training weeks, however you want to structure those. But week four is a deload and you're cutting, you know, generally the volume by say 40%. And maybe you're cutting the intensity a little bit. This is what people love to debate over, how much you should cut the intensity. I always cut it about 20% because I felt like you needed a little bit of a break. Others would say, no, I don't cut intensity at all. I just cut volume. So regardless, there's the deload week, which happens at the end of a cycle or maybe in week three of a four-week block. What I moved to and what I'm having great success with, for especially for like more of my general pop clients, is what I would call an introductory week. So an introductory week just says, hey, week one is my lowest volume week. So it kind of works as a deload because systemically it's not as taxing. But I also know week one, I can do anything different and that client's going to be sore. I mean, literally two sets of just basic exercises. And because you're using new muscles or learning new motor patterns, you're sore the next day. So I just find this makes such a huge difference. And the other thing that it does it subtly shifts the mindset and I feel your athletes feel like well you know week four I don't like having to take a week off so now you skew that mindset a little bit you say no no no, we're not taking a week off we're just taking a week to really coach you up to really learn these new exercises so that the next three weeks we can go hard so it's a really subtle thing but shifting from what I would call deload weeks to more introductory level weeks makes a huge impact on kind of the psyche of the athletes and it makes your job as a coach that much easier. Okay, pulling this together here. Number 15, flip the sets and reps on your accumulation block. Now again, if you're of a certain age, you know that an accumulation block or a hypertrophy block, you gotta start with like eights or tens or twelves, right? So it's gotta be like three by eight or three by 10 or three by 12 or four by eight, whatever the case may be, it's gotta be high reps, right? And something I started doing probably six years ago, five, six years ago at least, was flipping the way I structure the accumulation block. So instead of three by eight, it's eight by three. Still working on 60 seconds rest, still getting the same total amount of reps, but here's the cool thing. I think three things happen when you flip the sets and reps in an accumulation block. Number one, every set of every rep is higher quality. Right? We all know if we're gutting out a set of eight, rep six is okay, rep seven, eh, maybe it's okay, and rep eight, we're just trying to grind it out. Right. Whereas if I'm just doing triples, they're really clean, they're really crisp, and everything looks good. So number one, you get a higher quality of movement. Number two, you get a higher relative intensity. So it's been forever since I've used percentages, so just work with me here. But let's say you're going three by eight. Well, you probably have to use like 60% of your 1RM for that day, right? Whereas if I go 8 by 3 it could be 70 or 75%. So my relative intensity is way up, yet the quality of my movement is higher. So I just really like flipping the script like this. It makes such a big difference. And last but not least, I stay pretty much purely alactic. And, you know, if we want to talk Isurin, you know, non-competing adaptations, where you can go purely alactic and purely aerobic, and they seem to jive pretty well together. So in those early training blocks, the more purely alactic stuff I can do and the more purely aerobic stuff that I can do, the better because they don't fight and they don't compete for demands. So just one of those little tips that I picked up years ago, I think probably Bill Hartman started doing it. I saw him do it with one or two clients and I'm like, damn it, that's smart. And I started using it and I've seen great success with it. I don't think I've done a traditional 
you know, accumulation block with eights or tens or twelves ever since. So flip the sets and the reps on your accumulation blocks. Let me know how it goes because I feel like you're going to see a huge improvement in the quality of the movement, in the relative intensity, and just in the fact that it's going to jive better with the overall program. Okay, number 16. You're going to love this one. Make it a goal to be a lazy coach. Yep, I said it. Be a lazy coach. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean you're just sitting around on your cell phone, like looking at other people when you should be coaching. Not what I mean at all. What I mean by this is that you should make it a goal to choose the best exercise for every single client and athlete you work with. Because here's what happens. If you choose the right exercise, you inherently don't have to coach as much, right? The right exercise puts them in the right position so that they can execute the movement the way that you want it without you having to give them feedback. So this is something that I have made a huge priority on with my own programs, you know, and I think part of it is I've spent years in the one-on-one environment, even in the the settings that I work in now, a lot of times it's me and one or two guys. Um, It's either like a private or a semi-private session. So sometimes you feel just compelled to talk a lot, right? But, you know, I want them to explore their body. I want them to explore movement. So if I'm constantly giving them feedback, I don't know if that's always helpful. They need to learn the movement for themselves. And this is something that Nick Winkleman has said for years, can't agree more. You know, there's a time and a place for me to jump in, but there's also a time for me to sit back and shut up and let them figure out the movement. So in my opinion, this is kind of where I'm at now, I feel like the less I have to coach, the better my exercise selection is. So just think about that for a minute. Like, what if you didn't have to coach or cue your clients nearly as much? It's a weird shift in mindset. I get that. But this is something that I'm really striving towards right now. So that, you know, the less I have to cue, that changes the the whole dynamic. Because now if I do give a cue, it carries more weight, right? And now they're more apt to follow through versus if I'm giving them feedback or a cue every set of every rep, it's overwhelming and they're not truly learning or understanding the movement as well as I would like, all right? So give this a shot. Be really, really specific with your exercise selection. And I think if you guys do that, chances are you're gonna have to give less feedback, but ultimately your clients, your athletes are gonna see better results. Okay, guys, home stretch here. Number 17. And here's a big question. Before you write that first program, you need to ask yourself, what is this client prepared for? Right? Not what do I like, not what is the program I used before that I want to use with this client. You have to ask yourself, what are they prepared to do on day one? And it kind of comes back to underwhelming them early. Right, like once I have an idea of what they're prepared for, and this could be movement-wise, it could be work capacity-wise, it could be skill-wise. Start with maybe an exercise a half notch easier than it should. Make it easy for them early on. Give them success so that you get the positive momentum going. Uh, Jay Chung, who is our morning coach at iFast, who I love dearly, he is like the philosopher for the gym but he always talks about inertia. And it's so true. When you've got a client coming in and maybe they haven't had success before or they've struggled with certain aspects of fitness in the past, inertia is a mofo, right? So how do we get inertia going in the right direction? Well, we ask ourselves, what are they prepared for? How can I underwhelm them early so that I can get momentum and so that I can get inertia going in the right direction? So again, some of this is like tactical X's and O's. Some of it is just higher level. Like how do we get in the right mindset? How do we shift the dynamic of our training sessions by writing better programs? Okay, number 18, don't build without maintaining. Now, what do I mean by that? If you go back to, you know, trying to think, late 90s, early 2000s, when Dave Tate, Louis Simmons, they're writing for Elite, they're writing on Powerlifting USA, they're writing on T-Nation. I mean, I literally have like a three-inch binder of just Louis and Dave writings. And one of the things that they used to always talk about was like in classical Western periodization, 
there is, like Tudor Bampa has, you know, there's a anatomical adaptation or a hypertrophy phase. There's a strength phase. There's a power phase. And what they would talk about, and one of the biggest objections they had to this kind of training or this kind of programming was that you spend four weeks building or, or chasing an adaptation, and then you for, forget about it. So then you're on to the next block, and you're chasing that adaptation, but you're never maintaining the stuff that you did in the past. So I think this is something that's really critical, and if you look at how I tier my programs, there's always an initial goal, there's always a, a true adaptation that I'm chasing, or something that I'm trying to push the limits of, and then there's something I'm always trying to maintain, right? So again, coming back to, let's say we have three blocks. We've got an accumulation block, a force block, a power block. In the accumulation block, it's very simple. I'm trying to build connective tissue strength. I'm trying to build general work capacity, get the athlete ready to train. You know, Maybe one other piece would be like movement quality and movement skill. So that's block one. Block two, now I'm chasing force output. How can I make this athlete more powerful? Or if I'm being specific, how can I increase their force output you know, while maintaining the skills and the qualities that I developed early on. So I don't want to just forget about movement quality. I don't want to just forget about, you know, general kind of tissue strengthening work, but I am going to shift the elements around. So with force development, that's probably going to be my primary lift. And I'm going to push that really hard. And then the other stuff, where whether it's movement quality, whether it's tissue strength and, and you know, tissue resiliency, I'm going to work on that with my assistance lifts. So this is a really critical piece, guys. Always think about what am I building, what am I developing, and what am I maintaining? So it kind of muddies the waters maybe just a little bit, right? Because the goal is to keep the goal the goal. I get that. So what is the goal? Number one. Number two, what am I trying to maintain? What am I trying to hold on to? And if you start writing every program with that mindset, guaranteed you're going to get better results. And guaranteed, your clients, your athletes are going to be more robust as a result. Okay, last but not least, and this is something, guys, I can't tell you, I'm, I'm probably ashamed at how long it took me to figure this out. Or maybe not to figure it out, but to really 100% buy into it and embrace it. Number 19, you don't have to follow the program. Fact facts. You don't have to follow the program. Just because it's written on this this piece of paper right here doesn't mean you have to do what it says on this piece of paper on that training day. You know, as the saying goes, you don't train the program, right? You train an athlete. And every athlete is going to be a little bit different every time they come in. So just because it says eight sets of three at 75%, you know, sets on the minute or whatever it is, you know, if a guy just broke up with his girlfriend and his dog died and he went on, you know, a 24-hour bender and then showed up at your gym, he's probably not ready to perform that day, you know, versus the guy that understands, hey, I'm going to get my seven and a half hours sleep or my five sleep cycles, as Nick Little Hales would say. I'm going to get my five sleep cycles and I'm going to eat this all organic diet and I'm going to meditate and I'm going to do the things necessary on my off days to earn my high intensity training days. You know, sometimes people aren't ready to train and that's okay, right? Now, if it's a constant theme, that's a problem. That's something else you have to deal with. But at the end of the day, train the athlete in front of you. Don't blindly follow the program. Train the athlete in front of you. And there's tons of ways you can do this, right? I've done all of these things. Sometimes I do fewer sets. Sometimes I do fewer reps. Sometimes I decrease the intensity. Sometimes I change the exercise altogether, right? So let's say somebody is back squatting and they're just not feeling it or their back feels sketchy that day. I mean, I've had days like that. Okay, hey man, let's abort mission. Let's go, we'll two kettlebell front squat. We'll get three sets of five. We'll get a little bit of stimulus to your legs and then we're gonna move on and we'll figure out what else we can do that day. All right, so it's just like a hall pass here, right? It's a permission slip. You don't have to follow the program. If something's not going well or the athlete's not prepared to train, that is fine. Don't sweat it. Figure out a way to get them a training effect for that day and then move on with life. Okay, guys, so 54 minutes in. Hopefully, I did not bore you to tears. Most importantly, I really hope you took something away from this. You know, maybe it's one or two tips. If it's more than that, great. 
But you know, take one or two of these things and start really thinking about how it can apply to you. Chances are over 19 tips, one or two really stood out for you. And I would ask you to you know, either make yourself like a little post-it note or if you got like a little, you know, uh, area where you write your programs, maybe put something there like a little reminder to just constantly be conscious of that one thing that you feel like is going to make you a better coach or that's going to improve your program design skills. Because look, I'd like to think I'm doing it at a fairly high level now, but look, there's always room for improvement and there's always things that we can do better. I think, you know, young coaches, you're young, you're malleable, you're trying to filter stuff out, you're at one place, whereas older coaches that have been doing this a little bit longer, now it's more like, hey, I had success with this thing, but I stopped doing it. Now this this podcast or this article triggered, you know, that thought process again, and now I'm going to start doing that again. Okay, my friend, so that does it for this week's episode, 19 Ninja Tricks to help you write better training programs. Like I said, I actually published this almost five years ago now. I published this in 2017, but look, like the core principles of program design haven't changed. Nuance, yes. Details, yes. But core principles are core principles, and they're there for a reason. So I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I really hope you took something away from it. If you did and you're interested in learning more about this stuff and diving in a little bit deeper, think about coming to my Complete Coach Seminar. Like I said, it's a couple weeks out, but I feel like we are going to take this stuff from the assessment process and plug it in directly via case studies. So we're going to assess somebody live and in the flesh. From there, we're going to take all their movement limitations, the things they need to work on, smash all that together and write a program in real time to help you better understand that process. So again, if you enjoyed the episode, do me a small favor, go subscribe right now wherever you consume podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, Spotify, the Amazon store. Subscribe right now today so you know each and every week when a new episode drops because I'm telling you, man, I'm super stoked. I have some great great shows coming up in the coming weeks. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back next week with our next episode. Take care.